Welcome everyone uh, to Wellness Wednesday and the focus of today is uh, time for care partners. Uh, I am Elaine Book. Um, some of you may, uh, I, we've already met and to others I'm new. I'm the social worker in the Movement Disorders Clinic at the Center for Brain Health on campus and also um, uh, proponent of the uh, brain wellness program and or, or enthusiast of the brain wellness program. And so um, today we really are recognizing the value that care partners play in supporting people with chronic conditions. And so that is why we are dedicating today just to topics related to care partners. So we have three speakers today um, with a diverse backgrounds and many years of experience. And we're gonna be talking and learning about resources, uh, about communication, and a little bit about self-care. So our three speakers today are Stacy Dawes, Trisha Wallace, and um, Donna Propowski. And I will each uh, I will interview or inter, uh, introduce each one of them as we start. And they will each do their talks, and then we will save some time um, for questions towards the end. So once again, just in terms of housekeeping, I recommend that everybody mute, mute themselves. Um, and that makes it a lot easier on the audio for everyone else. And you're welcome to have your um, video on or off, whatever you are comfortable with. Uh, and like I said, we'll have time for questions at the end, and certainly you're welcome to put a few questions in the chat, and I'll try to respond to those as well. All right, so with no further ado, we will start off uh, with our first speaker, who is Stacy Dawes. And Stacy and I have known each other for many years, so it's really fun to work with her again. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about her. Early in her career, she worked with children, parents, and foster parents through Child Protective Services. And this really did provide a much deeper understanding for the complexities of family dynamics and the importance of support programs and resources. Now, Stacy has spent the majority of her career working for Parkinson's Society BC, but has recently moved to the role of Provincial Caregiver Engagement Lead at Family Caregivers of BC. Stacy has grown up in a family of dedicated caregivers, all who really contributed to the health and well being of a family member who suffered from a neurological damage at birth. And so it's with this exposure that she chose this career in social work and has a deep seated desire to support care partners. And she strongly supports um, the care that they provide. Over to you, Stacy. Thank you so much, Elaine. And thank you all for being here today, first and foremost. Um, I know it takes a lot of planning um, and time to, to dedicate to being here today. So I just wanna honor, honor your commitment um, and your time. So I'm just gonna share my screen and we'll just jump right on into it. There we go. Does that look good to everybody? Just need to so I can see what I'm looking at here. Um, so, as Elaine mentioned, my name is Stacy Dawes, and I'm the Provincial Caregiver Engagement Lead at Family Caregivers of BC. Just a little bit about our organization. We're a nonprofit charity dedicated 100% to the well-being of family caregivers. Um, we have been around in this province for 30 years. Um, we were serving just in the Victoria area up until about 10 years ago when we became a provincial organization. Um, and we are only, we're one of four provincial organizations across Canada that 100% uh, of our services and programs is for care partners and, and family caregivers. Our three pillars include caregiver support, um, education through webinars and blogs and podcasts, and engagement and collaboration on, um, 
on the health authority level. So sitting at committees and doing presentations um, it, within healthcare. The question that we get often, and I'm sure you ask yourself this as well, is what is a family caregiver? So a family caregiver is a friend uh, or family member who provides care and support to somebody living with a disease, a disability, or frailty due to aging. The role of the family caregiver is mutually determined by the people providing the care and support as, and support as well as those who are receiving it. So how big is caregiving? One in four people in Canada provided care or help to a family member or friend with a long-term health condition, a physical or mental disability, or aging-related needs, and almost two-thirds of those caregivers were 45 years or older. And in BC, um, there's approximately 1.4 million caregivers providing care to a family, friend, spouse, loved one. Caregivers, let's be honest here, they do a lot and way more than what these stats show us. Um, this is from a stats can um, from 2018 and um, from their survey that they did uh, came back was 40 or sorry, 75% help with transportation, 23% help with medical treatments, 22% provide personal care and 40% provides scheduling and coordinating appointments. Some of these themes may resonate with you. Caregivers speak about being on the edge of depression, edge of injury, almost burned out or burning out, needing a break or respite was often mentioned related to this. Caregivers shared repeatedly with us at our organization that they are caregiving on top of a full-time job, on top of being a parent, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, on top of trying to have their own life outside of caregiving as well as integrating it with their care recipient. You also may feel like you're on the outside of the care team, society, you may feel alone, you may feel invisible and you may feel like you're in need of information, resources, and knowing how to navigate this journey. And first step is doing something like this today. So Family Caregivers of BC, we place a lot on the value of, of connecting with caregivers. A big challenge for caregivers is isolation and asking for help is something most caregivers really, really struggle with. So what we mean by connecting is reaching out to other people, seeking support through community organizations, friends, family, neighbors, sharing, source, sharing their stories through support groups. Um, so our organization, we offer a non-judgmental space to share through virtual support groups. And I know that many or other organizations are doing the exact same thing and trying to find a sense of belonging with others that can truly, truly relate to the good and the bad, everything that goes along with caregiving. Allowing others to share in the care of the care recipient is sometimes easier said than done, but something small that you can do is make a list of the daily and weekly tasks that need to be done, ask the people in your life to commit to those tasks that you're willing to let them do. It can be hard to let go of control, but sharing the care is fundamental to making caregiving sustainable for your family and yourself. So contacting community organizations that provide support and programs and services for family caregivers and address and challenge any feelings of guilt that you may have when you reach out and ask for help. Both you and the person you're caring for will benefit from being held by community and having a network to rely on. So a great way to feel supported 
is attending a support group. So part of this uh, connection. Um, so attending a support group where you can share your concerns, receive a support from others in similar situations. Um, I know that there are many virtual support groups that are focused on caregiving all throughout this province. Um, it could be general, like Family Caregivers of BC. We host a weekly, on Thursday, a weekly virtual support group uh, for caregivers from 2 to 3.30. Um, we also have a monthly men's group as well um, for caregivers. Um, so that's a general group. And then there are disease specific groups. Um, just from my experience with Parkinson's Society, I'm sure Trisha's gonna touch on it after, um, that I know that they also have specific caregiver support groups uh, for those who are caring for somebody with Parkinson's. Um, on our website, uh, you will see this, that you will see the list of the support groups um, that are all throughout the province as well. Um, and another option, I don't have it here, is uh, but BC211 is another nonprofit organization that can link um, caregivers all throughout the province um, to community programs and support groups. So online support groups and resources can be a helpful to caregiving, needing support and finding that fellowship um, that, that you truly need on the daily. Personal supports. Personal support networks may be a natural thing in your life, uh, but not everybody has a naturally occurring family uh, for so many reasons. For some people, creating a support network is a process that takes a lot of effort to form and a lot of effort to maintain. Personal support networks are vital for ongoing social and practical support uh, to care for the care recipient and for the caregiver. Such informal support comes with a lot of love and a lot of respect and sometimes a sense of duty or responsibility. So to care for family and friends. For the caregivers, it's important to seek out and say, yes, yes, please, um, I will accept the support from you, even though it's really difficult. As caregivers, you feel like you can handle it all because you know the most. Something at Family Caregivers that we often encourage you to do is find a circle of support. So thinking about what I've been discussing about thinking about connections, personal support, support groups, you can create a circle of support to maximize the positive potential of your caregiving journey. So for those who are wanting to have strength or expand their support network, um, FCBC, Family Caregivers of BC, we have a great webinar focused on building a gold medal of support and it is available on our, on our website. So within this circle of support um, can be friends, it can be neighbors, it can be your faith group, a community program. So think of it expanding it outside of your small, small circle and bringing in people that can provide that support through your community. So how do you do this? How do you take this action? So identifying and taking action on these caregiver needs. The needs of the care recipient are often great. As you know, you live it every day. It's the thing that you think about from the morning, the time you wake up until the time you go to bed, you're always focused on your, your loved one's needs. Um, and are, they are, the, there's, they're in the uppermost in your minds um, on the people of the care team, such as your doctors, your nurses, social workers, um, and even the caregiver themselves. But what about your caregiver needs? What was the last time somebody asked you what you needed? So identifying and taking action on these caregiver needs are something that you can implement through these small steps. So since most, so much of caregiving requires that your own needs be placed on the back burner, it's important for you to be able to identify and to be able to advocate for your own needs and well-being. It involves effort and it involves self-sacrifice, but when the caregiver consistently, when you neglect your needs, you are at risk for developing or worsening your own health issues. And what's the saying? You cannot pour from an empty cup. Once again, easier said than done, really, really tough to do. So we discussed the importance of a circle support um, how do we take this action? So we can focus 
on one step at a time or short-term action that can be accomplished in a week. Keeping it short-term, very easy to help reach, and very easy to reach helps build the confidence and success in reaching these larger goals. It's always so um, motivating for myself when I make this list, small goals, and you see those check marks on it. And it gives you the motivation to then um, reach these bigger goals or make bigger goals. Focusing on smaller steps towards a bigger goal in the future and aiming to develop a plan to maintain and increase your own well-being. So these are some resources that we have at Family Caregivers of BC. Um, we do have a toll-free support line that is available uh, Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 7 p.m. Um, we acknowledge that there are caregivers that are still working full time. Um, so we have extended our hours during COVID um, at seven, until 7 p.m. We do provide a caregiver connection newsletter, which is a quarterly newsletter that goes out uh, to anybody that's on our mailing list. We also do biweekly um, e-news. So that's all about upcoming programs, webinars, or any other resources that we have uh, found provincially. We do a lot of webinars and articles. We have a podcast, we have booklets. Um, if you go to our website, to the Learning Center, um, we have an incredible amount of webinars and resources and help sheets, um, right from financial to um, emotional support and communication. Our search bar is really great. So even if you go to our homepage and you search in what specific topic you're looking for, you will usually get uh, quite an extensive list of resources. And we also do, um, in, a, in addition to doing webinars, we also do Facebook Lives. Um, and a lot of that seems to be more on the mindfulness meditation sort of um, direction. So I see that this is wrong. This is supposed to read 8.30 to uh, 7 p.m., but this is our toll-free line. Um, please do give us a call. Um, we are always available to just sit with you and answer your questions. And sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. And it's just a matter of giving us a call and, and introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your story. And um, our staff will be able to navigate that and really, really provide you with some great, great resources. Um, so some types of things that they do do on this call is one-to-one -one emotional support. Um, they can help you navigate the healthcare system, um, access to support groups, newsletters, um, sign you up for a newsletter and other referrals to community resources. Another program that we do have, um, which is kind of, um, it's a little bit more of a step above the, the call line, um, is one-to-one -one caregiver coach program. So if you feel you can benefit from more one-to-one -one support, um, the call line can refer you to the one-to-one -one caregiver coaching for more complex issues. So a typical call, uh, just to give you an example on what that would look like, um, I have an example here. It's in a moment of stress, Max phones the FCBC caregiver support line again. He starts apologizing for continually phoning, but he's quickly put at ease when his call is welcomed. He shares his current concerns about Sally's declining health, cost of services and equipment. Um, the staff, FCBC staff person shares key information about financial programs, then e they email him the financial summary document covering several financial options. Max is referred to the Family Caregivers of Doom program. It is free. It's one-to-one -one sessions with a, a professional coach, um, which help you prioritize your concerns and help you to develop an action plan. So something similar that um, I touched on in my presentation. These are just a couple of examples of some webinars that we do have. Um, I, met, I touched on the gold medal, net, gold medal network of support previous in my presentation. Um, get help and hope access to community resources that you need. Uh, we have advanced care planning for caregivers and we're also actually doing uh, an advanced caring planning for caregivers tomorrow. Um, registration is still opened if you are interested and we do have quite a few webinars on mindfulness as well. 
So just in closing, I just want you to know that you are not alone in this. Um, there are incredible, incredible community programs out there and services. Um, we are always looking to support you the best that we can. Um, know that you are not alone and you should never run alone. And uh, we are truly ready to travel this distance with you. I know we're going to be saving the questions and everything towards the end. So I just want to thank you for your time um, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I know myself that I learned some things about family caregivers of VC that I did not know. And I, I absolutely love um, that reference to the gold medal network and, and those really valuable tips in terms of how do you create your own support team. So thank you for that. And we may hear from some other people a little bit later, um, so now we will move on to um, our next speaker, Trisha Wallace. Uh, Trisha comes to us with a background of 31 years of nursing experience in the field of mental health with adults of all ages in hospital and community settings. Uh, Trisha has also worked as a nurse educator at UBC and Langara College. In 2019, she finished her training in counseling psychology and gaining experience in many areas of therapy, including a 10-month practicum in addiction recovery that involved both individual and group counseling. As a registered clinical counselor at Parkinson Society BC and in her private practice, Trisha provides therapy, information, and support for individuals, for couples, for families, all who are living with the impact of uh, chronic conditions. Thank you for joining us today and over to you, Trisha. Thanks so much, Elaine, and I'm really glad to be here. Welcome everybody. I'm just going to move on to my PowerPoint here. So I'm going to talk about effective communication. Uh, and I really, uh, really am happy to hear um, all the support and information that comes from, from family caregivers of BC. Stacy, we certainly use them a lot, um, don't we? Um, it's offering so much support. So I wanted to kind of build on this a little bit more in terms of connecting and reaching out and looking at some insights, some skills that we might be able to uh, to gain um, over this uh, short time that we'll have to uh, talk and also through the questions afterwards. And what I usually find when talking with people is that there are times when they're looking for strategies for more effective communication. Usually it's around ongoing anxiety and challenges with that. Also, if there are uh, questions around withdrawal. So your loved one, the person who you're caring for, starts to withdraw in some way. And there's a distance between yourself and the other person that you're trying to, trying to fill and trying to figure out. And the third thing is feeling under threat. And uh, this can happen um, through our, our care partners, perhaps having a change in, in, in uh, personality, in, in, in uh, stress management. Uh, and it also could be through uh, feeling kind of threatened or unsure with what's going on with the healthcare team and how to navigate that. So those are the three sort of key areas um, that I'm focusing on for this talk. I'm gonna start with assumptions because Typically, assumptions are the first things that we move to. We can quickly make decisions and have ideas about what's going on based on our previous experience. And by definition, assumptions don't require any extra data from around us. They, they are really driven through our experiences. Now we need assumptions, we need to make quick decisions. You know, as caregivers, you have to make quick decisions and you're, you have a lot of experience with a lot of different things. But like this saying says, sometimes it's good to take a moment and kind of question our assumptions. Wipe off our windows and our views of the world and other people's in it and the experiences that we have so that we can look at things a little bit different. Let some more light come in. 
And that really can play out in many different ways. Um, I can think of, I might have an assumption that uh, someone is looking at me a certain way. Um, a healthcare worker uh, looks like they're angry and I assume that they're angry with me and my response to them might be curt, might be um, sort of angry back. And that sets the tone for a conversation. If I think, hmm, I'm curious, I'm noticing that person has a change or a different sort of uh, view and uh, affect change in their uh, gestures, I can think, hmm, okay, they're feeling angry, but it's not necessarily about me. And if I respond neutrally or with some kindness, I might actually be able to switch around and change the tone of the conversation. So these sorts of things um, can happen quite quickly. And of course they can happen um, with the people that uh, we care for so much. And if we take a moment, that's the, the, the challenge really, is to be able to take a step back. And when we're under a lot of stress, and typically as caregivers, you're under a tremendous amount of stress quite often, always thinking of something else you need to do, to find the time becomes the challenge. And that next piece of that is sort of finding a time to be a little bit more curious and take a, a breath is really talking about increasing your tolerance to stress and what that might look like for you. In this picture, you can see this woman is doing quite a, a serious practice of mindfulness. I know Donna will talk more about this, but to, to explore ways in which we can find a sense of grounding and a, and a way that we can take a breath so that we can expand the distance between the information that we're taking in and our response or reaction. And this is why to a stress tolerance is, is like a superpower for, for caregivers. It can really help to reset. It can really help you to make the space that you need to think about how you want to respond, what you want to say. And it can also allow for you to think in a more flexible way. And when we think with more flexibility, all of a sudden these options open up to us in terms of how we're going to proceed and what that's going to look like. It also sends messages back to our nervous system to say, hey, everything's going to be better. Everything has the potential to change. And that also in turn helps with the stress cycle and with our communication overall. So let's look at some patterns. If we can't kind of find space for this shift and reflection, we can typically get into some pretty solid communication patterns that can be challenging to break and can also be destructive over time. So looking at changing up patterns is an important part of growing our communication skills. First of all, we sort of have to observe and take an observational role and sort of notice the times and the places and the people who we're with when we tend to get into stressful or conflicting sort of communication. Uh, one way to kind of add on to this is to figure out what's going on inside of us and also to focus on the feeling that the other person is uh, sending us, what we're noticing. Because quite often if we get cued by a care partner uh, through, let's say, they've come to call us, they've come to, they're asking for some help. We might just go quickly into do mode. Oh, they're calling me, I gotta go do something for them. And if we're already feeling like, I'm doing so much, I can't, can't do another thing, and we get that message, we can go into an interaction with a lot of stress and tension. And we might not be able to really view what's going on with an accurate perspective. So if we pull things back and we pay attention to the feeling behind a remark, we can then often break the patterns around 
the remarks that people are, are making. I can think of uh, someone might come in and call uh, many, many times because the bed is uncomfortable and they need some help and they're feeling, they're really actually feeling anxious and uncomfortable. And if we keep on paying attention to the bed and the bedding, we're not, we're missing the message that they might be sending emotionally. So if you can validate emotions first, that can help to shift the pattern and you might then move into uh, a way to say, oh, I'm feeling really anxious or it looks like I'm feeling anxious too with you. This must be really hard for you. Uh, you know, that reminds me of the time when we were really anxious. Remember when that car broke down and, in, and we were trying to get it fixed and that storm was coming and you were the only person who could figure it out? You really saved the day. That was a really excellent, just this really helpful thing that you did. And I really remember that. So you kind of take an emotion and you find a way to shift the narrative around the motion and make it about something that your loved one did that was really successful and really helpful. And sometimes that kind of just shifts the gears in the communication. Um, and that kind of fits in with catching, doing some, uh, doing, uh, catching people doing things right. Because we can often observe what think people are doing wrong. And when we're anxious and we're stressed out, we tend to do that more. So try and notice when people are doing things right and make sure that you uh, give that person, um, reflect on that and, and just um, say, hey, that's right, I noticed this happened, really saw that you were able to get up more today. And, and that's just, I'm so glad you could do that. And also don't forget to do that for yourselves as well. So catch yourselves doing something right. And make sure you take that moment to give yourself a pat on the back. Um, they've also, there's timing around uh, activities and changing up. So you might notice that there's a schedule uh, and around 3.30 every day, uh, your loved one starts to become more stressed out, more uh, confused, or more agitated. And then that's when communication can break down. So you can might find patterns also around medication. So people living with Parkinson's quite often, it has to do when there's a, either an on or an off period as the medication kind of becomes more effective and less effective in the body. If you notice these things, um, then you would try and break the pattern and do something a little different before that typical time when the person has a challenge um, in, with their communication. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so those are um, some things to look at. Say yes as much as possible if you can too. That's another one that's really helpful. Say yes more. Notice, how many times did I say yes today? Because often when we're stressed, we say more, a lot more, a lot, no a lot more than we think. So here's some um, eight key ways to resolving conflict. And this, can, this is for families. Diana Mercer wrote this for, for couples, actually. But it really, I think, plays well for just any situation with um, conflict. Uh, so one of the key things she's talking about is to be hard on the problem, not the people. And I'm going to extend this also to the, be hard on the solutions that you, that you have. Because we really want to make sure that we're talking about what's working and what's not working rather than what a person is doing wrong and what they're doing right. So when people feel judgment, they tend to pull back, they get defensive, and they're not going to communicate in a safe way as if they would if you say, you know, I think there's a problem here. Um, there's still some difficulty with walking, for example, and I think we really need to work on that um, rather than talking about the people um, who are involved in it directly. Uh, listening is really important as well. Acknowledging and really paying attention. Make sure that you take a chance to really listen to what the person's saying rather than just waiting for a time that you want to insert your ideas into the situation. So problem solving and conflict resolution is a lot around being able to sit back and listen. And this can be really important, for example, in uh, caregiving, if, they, if you have any groups uh, or meetings with the healthcare team and uh, people might be saying things that you don't agree with and you just wanna get in there and jump. If you can just take a break and really listen to what they're saying, then you can ask more about and learn a little bit more about their perspective. I statements, of course, are really important, and that refers to talking about your own experiences and your own feelings rather than jumping to a judgment of others. 
Um, and uh, again, this the fourth one comes around with with assumptions, right? If we we come to the understanding that someone's coming to a meeting or they're coming to help um, our loved one um, with a supportive uh, attitude and what they're trying to do their best, we're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, that's very helpful. Uh, challenging conversations are really important to have and they're really hard to do, but if we let things fester and sit for a long time, it becomes more awkward and more difficult. We can actually have more anxiety around it and then end up um, having even a greater difficult time to to kind of work through the issues. And again, if you use an observation, uh, oh, I noticed this was different. Can you tell me why you decided to, um, you know, adjust the wheelchair that way? That's a way to kind of get the other person's perspective around what's going on rather than making a judgment. And of course, conversations are really important to keep on going. Um, saying you're sorry, saying you don't know, uh, saying I know this is hard, but I think we need to talk about it. Taking that first step is really important. And um, again, long term, asking yourself, would do you have to be right all the time? So being able to kind of acquiesce and say, you know what, I think you do have a point. And, and recognize that can really diffuse conflict and, and really inspire other people to, to engage and, and kind of uh, take part again in the conversation rather than people going to their corners and being in a fight kind of mode. So in, in review, we're really looking for, for communication, we're looking for the long game. So um, in football, that means that um, there, there's a whole bunch of little technical steps along the way, and they might not seem to make sense in the short term, but what are we looking for overall? So if a loved one isn't eating well, and then every meal becomes a big fight, then we have to step back and say, well, what am I wanting my loved one to, to have here? I'm wanting them to be comfortable. I'm wanting them to, to be able to have some energy and to be able to, 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 to you know, focus, et cetera, whatever they might be needing. So if you pull back a little bit, it's not really about forcing the person to eat. It's about finding out what they want and how they want to go through the goals through that. And finding out a little bit more about why they might not want to eat. And, you, and some very interesting information might come to you um, if, if that um, is the case. Just to sort of pull back and ask if you can, if they can communicate. Otherwise, it might be just a trial and error. But knowing that it's not a push and a force um, can help to actually diffuse the, 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 the challenge there. Um, we want to also know what kind of messages we're sending. And this kind of comes back to uh, self grounding and, and reflecting on our tone, our attitude, and the tension that we might be bringing to um, what we're, who we're talking to and what we're talking about. Um, the environment is also really important as well. Uh, we might be worried about environments for the people we're caring for, and we forget that also there's a lot of stuff going on in our environments that we tend to tune out. But they can kind of filter in, and those distractions and those stressors can kind of filter in to our minds and create a sense of overwhelm. So just as we want a calm and quiet place for our loved ones, we also want to make sure that we're keeping in mind our own environments as well and, and our, the attention we spend to um, ourselves when we're talking and sharing information. Um, barriers that exist as well. Time is a really big one, isn't it? And so some suggestions for communication time-wise is to uh, have, uh, have your information ready for uh, any care teams, any healthcare workers. Uh, ask uh, as much as possible to share things in writing, ask for timelines for feedback. A lot of information I get from care, uh, caregivers as well. I asked the team three weeks ago about what's going on in the medications and I haven't heard anything yet. And I say, have you called them again? Have you said, I'd like to know by Tuesday? And so setting some timelines like that can also help with um, getting faster answers and getting more clear answers. If you're sharing informa information with a healthcare team, try to pare it down to the shortest little section, uh, the, the key ideas that you want to share. The backstory you might be able to share later, but if you're wanting an answer and you want it quite quickly and clearly, make sure that your messages are quite clear and 
relatively short to the team as well. And that can really help. So thank you very much for uh, sharing this time again. I'm looking forward to hearing Donna's uh, additions. And of course, we're going to be here for, uh, for, thank for questions. And Parkinson Society BC, now I don't have a link here, but um, this is a stepping stone. So one of the first steps you might make uh, is to just look up Parkinson Society BC. We have a, a, a wide range of supports and uh, we've got support groups, we've got online support groups uh, for different um, for different stages of Parkinson's. We ha also have a provincial network of support groups and those support groups are uh, many of them in localities and they're also going online as well with Zoom and that sort of thing. So I would suggest that you make call rather than go on the website call Parkinson Society BC and um, you'll be able to be guided uh, with um, some very support uh, great support from our staff. Thanks. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you for that. And you know, I'm, uh, we are going to do some questions after, um, but I just want to add to that as we do have people who are providing care to people who have a variety of different uh, conditions. But so I think the messaging being, you know, reach out to the MS Society, reach out to the um, Huntington Society, reach out to the Alzheimer's Society. You know, most uh, conditions do have a, a supportive organization associated with them too. And on the BC Brain Wellness website, we do have a page of partners and many, many of those types of organizations are listed there. So um, you might even visit that spot first to see, you know, what organization might be the best source of support for you. Okay, and I am looking at the time and just a heads up, we may go a few minutes past 12 o'clock. Uh, you're welcome to stay on and certainly I understand if you need to go. So we're going to move on to our last speaker. Um, Dr. Donna Proprowski is a registered psychologist specializing in therapy with adults, couples, as well as adolescents and children. She incorporates a variety of different strategies in response to the needs um, and preferences of the people who she works with. Some of these approaches include mindfulness techniques, self-assessment and monitoring, um, cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, uh, somatic awareness, psychodynamic psychotherapy, so a variety of different kinds of approaches. She has been in private practice since 1996 and is currently coming to us. She lives in Victoria, so she's coming to us from Victoria and uh, does a lot of work uh, by telehealth as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Donna. Hello, Donna. <laughs> I think Donna just muted. There, I just got it. I realized. Okay. I, was, I just wanted to say thank you for including me. And it's such a delight to hear uh, the platform that's been created both by Stacy and uh, Trisha at this point. Because um, I really want to acknowledge that overview that Stacy has provided and her professional lifelong commitment to caregivers and it really helps me understand the context a lot more and it's we're really lucky somebody is involved in an organizing organization like that that brings people together and then Trisha's information on communication is just fabulous and I really encourage anyone who's listening to not hesitate to use any of her PowerPoint slides as discussion pieces you know one to one or in a peer group. Um, and I hope that my presentation will sort of build on that a little bit, maybe even uh, reiterate some of those things that offer something a little bit different, but related. So here I go with my screen. Uh, where is it now? There we go. And I have to go on to the slideshow. There. Hmm. Now I have to go backwards. Oh, I don't know how to move this around properly. If you just click your back arrows on your keyboard, that will usually take you to the front. Or if you just scroll okay. up to, there you go. Okay, yeah. okay. 
So um, I'm calling this Caring for the Caregiver. And the focus really is on acknowledging your experience as a caregiver. So I hope that what I'm offering will give you material to reflect on in the future, but also even in the moment today. This may bring up a lot of ideas and feelings and thoughts for people, and I hope that is helpful in some way in just acknowledging your role in, in the life of someone you really care about. So I considered this in sort of four parts. It's really important as caregivers for you to assess your situation and do this on a regular basis, not as a one-time thing because things are changing and will change. And then to be able to acknowledge stress, we all have stress in life, but you have unique stresses as caregivers and the acknowledging of that stress is a very powerful way to slow down and consider your needs, which I know both of the previous speakers have mentioned. Um, I'm going to also focus a lot on the power of validating emotion uh, because our emotions are a data set for want of nothing else, but it's a very important data set that we cannot dismiss. It lets us know what's going on. And uh, for you to be fully and completely giving to the persons that you care for, it's important for you to take care of you. And it starts with validating those emotions. And then we'll look at some of the strategies for rejuvenation. So in assessing a situation, I think much of this people already know, but I just have laid it out here. It's important to consider the kind of chronic illness that you're helping a person cope with. And of course, those things can be quite changeable depending on the condition and the needs, the specific needs of that person, as well as your own ability. And as I, I think it was um, Stacy mentioned, many caregivers are over the age of 45. So, you know, your own aging, your own health issues, your own finances will also be changing over time. And those can be sources of stress. And they're just so important to acknowledge and to, to note um, to look at the social supports that you do have. And uh, that's why I'm so appreciative of the fact that we have many organizations that support caregivers because uh, we know the power of social support and also how difficult it is when people do not feel support or are feeling a lot of isolation. And then of course, uh, in any situation of caregiving, there are usually other family needs and those cannot be ignored and need to be acknowledged as well. So in acknowledging stressors, uh, one of the ways we can think of stress is in categories. Again, the physical demands, the many, many things that uh, caregivers that you will be doing, um, but also the emotional journey, uh, being with somebody that you love and care about and have compassion for, you're feeling their feelings, you have your own feeling experiences, uh, is very, very important not to dismiss or minimize the importance of that emotional journey and to find space and time to uh, be with it. Um, and to acknowledge the social changes that come with caregiving, um, be it through the limitations of time, your social time, or it can be that you find that certain social connections fall away as you're engaged in caregiving. There are also, of course, uh, financial demands and stresses that come with this role. I would like to talk a lot more about emotions. And I think it's easy to get into a place with caregiving where the focus might be on what we call negative or more inconvenient emotions. Um, those are all there, they're important, they're powerful, but I think it's also, to me, very important to acknowledge the positive emotions, the reasons why we end up in a situation of caregiving. Now, clearly in many cases, it's with someone who's a long-term partner or a spouse, uh, but what keeps us there is our devotion, our compassion and commitment 
And of course, with all those feelings, there is going to be sadness, irritation, sometimes feelings of guilt, uh, maybe depression, resentment, frustration, feeling overwhelmed, um, loneliness, isolation, hopelessness, resignation, numbness, detachment, but also perhaps and hopefully appreciation, appreciation for this uh, connection you have to somebody that is so important to you and the times that you've had together even prior to the illness. Um, the connection you have, the support you feel. Um, and you know, I think some caregivers might even acknowledge that they feel support even from the person that they give care to. So it is a mutual uh, support. Um, and hopefully there's ways of help cultivating hope, determination, openness, and love. So I, I think it is important to acknowledge all those range of possibilities because in coping with the stress of caregiving, it is important to also have that capacity to reflect on what is feeding you, not just the things that are really stressful. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, emotions are indicators of your experience and stress level. Um, and anyone who's familiar with the concepts of mindfulness, and I know uh, Tricia was talking about this, it, it is important to be able to be with your feelings. And that way we get to see them as information and decide how we want to respond to our feelings rather than just react um, you know, in the moment. Um, but they're very, very important. And they let you know what's going on in your life, just how much stress you are having. Um, the great thing about emotions, and anyone who's practiced mindfulness techniques knows this, is that emotions change and shift over time and over situations, events, and thoughts. They're, they're really not static. You may have a day where you feel quite stressed, quite irritable, uh, but if you have the wherewithal and a moment to be with your feelings, even for two or three or five minutes, you will notice that you cannot. It is simply impossible to feel anger at a certain level of intensity 24-7. You may have moments of anger and irritation and frustration, but things shift and change over time. And that's why mindfulness practices are so powerful because it allows us to see the opening, or I think Trisha was uh, referring to some gap between the experience and how we respond. Uh, it slows us down. So emotions that are validated can be released. Uh, or another way of thinking of it is we're not as fused with what we're feeling. Uh, we've all had the experience of really feeling angry. And in that moment, we're one with the anger. And of course, that's when we may say or do things that we later regret. Um, but if we can slow down enough in the moment to acknowledge what we're feeling, then that emotion has less of a grip on us. It is not a denial of the emotion. It's not pushing it aside. It is acknowledging it. And uh, in acceptance and commitment therapy, we call it accepting the emotion. It doesn't mean we like it, but it ceases to have as much control over us. And then we can decide, well, what, what is the source of this emotion and what do I want to do about it? And that way, it doesn't become a chronic source of stress and resentment. Um, it's the challenge of stuffing emotions or ignoring them or denying them is they end up making us unwell. And then you're not as capable as a caregiver. So much of this will be familiar with pe to people, but I want to acknowledge it. It's important. Um, there's signs of chronic stress and know this for yourself, but even know it for people around you that are caregivers. And, and if you're in a peer support group, you know, you can notice if these kinds of things are happening for people. Um, if you're feeling you're, you're actively withdrawing from friends and family, if you're refusing invitations or not answering phone calls, 
there might be something going on there. And if you're not having the same interest in other activities that you previously enjoyed and you're chronically sad and irritable and hopeless or having changes in appetite or sleep, um, perhaps getting sick more often, maybe feeling you want to hurt yourself or the person you're caring for and are generally exhausted, irritable and anxious, that those, these are serious signs of chronic stress and they can even be signs of depression. And of course we know when people are caregiving over time and space, they're going to be more prone to even clinical depression or anxiety. And it's important to acknowledge that and know if that's happening for you and get the support you need and deserve. Um, these conditions are manageable and treatable and uh, these depression is something that occurs just generally in society among at least 20 to 25 percent of the population over their lifespan. So if you're a caregiver, you have a considerable amount of stress and there is a risk that you're going to have depression at times. You deserve to get support for that. So in looking at ways of uh, coping and rejuvenating, um, I have put up uh, a wellness wheel on my PowerPoint here. And, and wellness wheels, this is just a way of considering any number of things. So um, there's various ways of dividing it up. This one's divided up into seven sections. And I encourage you to consider this as a way of looking at how much stress, but also how much resource you have in these areas. Because we all vary in our lives uh, in how much resource we have emotionally, intellectually, physically, spiritually, and sometimes those are the areas that need more filling. Um, so it, it's a very individual thing, but this can be an interesting way of looking at our lives and how we're coping. And uh, again, I encourage you to perhaps even take this to a peer support group and uh, use it as a, a tool to sit down and talk about, oh, how are our spiritual resources this week? And uh, are, we, are we getting that cup filled up? So if we look at social, and I know this has been spoken of to some degree already by the previous speakers, it's just such an important way of relieving stress. And, you know, it can be a way of acknowledging all those emotions. But sometimes it's just about getting together with people and playing or watching a game or playing a game or going for a walk. It doesn't necessarily have to be heavy and about feelings. Could be. Um, that social time is a break. It's a way of rejuvenating and focusing on yourself. And you deserve and need that so that you can be that much more present for the person you love when you're caregiving. So I know both the previous speakers spoke of ways of getting connected through peer supports, whether they're formally or otherwise. I mean, you might even have the initiative or desire to create your own peer support group. And we are in a wonderful environment, certainly in the lower mainland, where there are many, many supports. And of course, because of technology, we can connect with people uh, throughout the world if needed. Uh, because I know there are some conditions that are quite rare and there may not be an organizing uh, society. Um, so give yourself permission for social time. Spiritually, um, I was thinking about this last night because I know this can be a trigger for some people. I use the word spiritual, for some people it's religious, for some people it's philosophical. But it's really about making meaning. And as human beings, we are meaning-making animals. I'm not convinced my poodle makes meaning the same way I do, even though she's really smart. Um, so it's important to think about what nourishes your spirit and sense of meaning. And you, know, you may find a desire or a way of connecting to a spiritual community. It can be a traditional religious one. It can be any number of spiritual communities. And again, in the lower mainland, there are many. 
um, and to look at how your beliefs support your experience of caregiving and the importance of self-care. Um, it is so important to find meaning and purpose outside of caregiving. Physically, um, any physician will tell you that, you know, the research on the role and the connection between stress and health and managing stress is, is huge. And, and sleep is just one of the most vital things that we can do to coping well. Um, if anything else falls away, the one thing you want to maintain is good sleep hygiene. And if you're not sleeping well, it may be an indicator that you're really overly stressed. Um, gee, my bullet on nourishment there, I think might be missing something, but I think it goes without saying, the way we eat and the kind of healthy nutrition we take in obviously nourishes our body and our ability to cope. Um, more importantly, movement and exercise have been so scientifically proven to reduce stress and reduce uh, any physical effects of stress. Uh, there is a huge number of studies on over a thousand individuals in some cases, people who have moderate depression and are divided into two groups, one group given a prescription for 30 minutes of movement daily and the other on antidepressants. And the group that does the movement does better. Um, so it doesn't have to be an intense workout. If you like intense workouts, that's great. But moving your body on a daily basis is very, very important. And of course, monitoring our use of alcohol and recreational drugs. As much as we like to alter our states in some ways, um, chronic use of these things is generally not a great way uh, to cope and uh, it tends to just numb out and ignore, help us ignore what we're feeling. Um, so if you really want to alter your state, you can run or swim or dance and, uh, and that can include music. So that's even beyond physical. So again, back to the emotional, uh, it's important to be able to validate and acknowledge your feelings and your experience and be able to release those as well as get a perspective. Um, monitoring your mood for signs of overload and stress, accessing professional and peer support. Having said that, one of the ways you can really work with your feelings, even without a professional in your life, is to use creative expression. And uh, some people have found this and discovered it naturally, but I've also worked with many clients who really enjoy doing something creative as children and then have forgotten about it. And then they can begin to explore it as adults and it's without judgment. It's not like you're doing it to you know, show anyone else. Surprisingly, sometimes people create some amazing things and then it does become something they use uh, professionally. But just to begin by releasing what you're thinking and feeling in writing or through some sort of visual modality. Uh, it can be photography. Um, sometimes people use scrapbooking if they don't feel they want to be drawing or painting. Um, ceramics, crafts, music. Um, these creative sources are really, really powerful. And if words are a problem, there is a real value to using the nonverbal. Sometimes there will be things that come out non-verbally in art or in color or photography that is surprising. And then to look back at it and realize what you were feeling beneath it. And then learning mindfulness strategies. And no doubt you could have a whole presentation on mindfulness strategies and what they are and how to implement them. Um, uh, if necessary, I can provide people with resources as to where to find many of those, but we have so many on the internet at this point. So um, one of the strategies to validate emotions is to just cultivate a daily practice to observe and identify your feelings. So it can be a formal sit down mindfulness meditation activity once or twice a day, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, I would encourage you to find ways to just check in two, three times a day for a few minutes, especially if you're caregiving 
role seems particularly stressful. And you know, it can be sitting for a moment, breathing, grounding deep into your body, and just letting your body slow down so the breath slows down. And then noticing whatever comes up, feeling it in your body, identifying the feelings, and trying to do that without judgment, just with curiosity. And this is how we create more space for our feelings. And for some people, this is very new. Um, but if it, even if it's familiar, it's very, very powerful because it gives you a break. And then you want to be able to notice the thinking that comes up with the feeling. And those thoughts could reflect whatever has gone on in the past, even the recent past, or future concerns. That's okay, again, to just notice these things without judgment and to be able to decide what do you need to do. Do you need to take a more of a break? Do you need to talk to a professional? Do you need to talk to the person you're involved with caregiving? Um, there are many possibilities depending on what comes up. But the key is to honor what you're feeling. So one of the things that I have found with a lot of clients that are interested in meditation and mindfulness is they have a notion that mindfulness and meditation, if, it's, if you're doing it right, your mind should go blank. And I can assure you that is definitely not the case, having been a meditator for many years. Um, mindfulness, from my understanding, is it's a way of being present with what comes up. And by being present, it allows more space for it so that, again, it tends to flow rather than cling to you. And within that, sometimes there's moments of open. It feels like your mind is empty. But I think as human beings, because we think and we feel so much, that idea of having a totally empty mind for great spans of time is uh, not really possible. And it's not even necessary. It's about being able to be mindful enough to not feel overwhelmed by your feelings or thoughts. And having said that, knowing that you will at times be overwhelmed by your feelings or thoughts, and then you come back and notice what you feel again with compassion for yourself. Another important support, I think, and I hope other people agree, is the natural environment. And we're, again, in a very wonderful part of the world. <clears throat> we can usually find a place to get away, even if it's in your yard or in the many parks that we, we are near. And this is, applies really throughout the province. So being in nature is very, very healing and rejuvenating. And just being able to be in the fresh air, notice the light, notice the green space. If you have companion animals, um, these are very powerful ways of being in the moment because if you've ever had any kind of cat or dog, they're just in the moment. Um, experiencing music, you know, and changing your environment with the kind of music that you choose to play. And really being mindful in the kind of living space that you can create. Um, we do really respond to what our rooms look like, whether it's cluttered or not, and how fresh the air is, and how soothing it is. And I know that uh, other speakers also mentioned financial uh, resources. I think many of the organizations provide supports that way and for other referrals. But it is so important to be able to consider this very, very practical side of caregiving and the future. Um, you know, it's true for all of us as we age, but I think additionally so if you're caregiving because the financial demands can be quite great and quite different. And I know that there are and have continued to be programs in the government um, for various disability supports, including the registered disability savings program and, and grants. Um, and so if people become new caregivers or people have new um, diagnoses, 
uh, it is important that they connect with organizations to be informed of those. I've done a lot of presentations for the MS Society, and I know they're very good at providing those connections. Um, but this is a, a whole other area that, of course, is very, very practical and mundane and very different from the emotional side of things, and yet just as important. And intellectually, um, it is important that we consider what our minds are doing. And sometimes our minds need a break um, and also keeps us sharp to do other things. Um, so caregivers, like with anyone who's aging, it's important to consider how we're using our minds and how we can rejuvenate ourselves or distract ourselves from other kinds of thinking. Uh, so I've just listed a number of things here. Um, it's really important to consider the programs at community centers and universities. There's more than ever uh, things for people to learn and do at any age. And uh, people could sometimes be surprised just by paging through the offerings that they find something they never considered before. And it gives you a break and a, a well-deserved rest from caregiving. Um, so I want to emphasize that I think people often feel guilty taking a break, and yet you can argue with yourself and say, I'm going to take this break because it's going to make me a more caring and loving and capable caregiver. So a bit of a summary, tips to avoid burnout. Uh, stay educated and, and informed about the illness and the challenges of the person that you're caring for. And there's probably always new research on the horizon. So it's good to, to stay informed. Um, take care of yourself and practice healthy living. Stay social. Accept and ask for help. And it is challenging to do that. Uh, but it is something that we, need, we all need to do. Um, acknowledging your emotions and expressing those feelings and emotions in a healthy way. Taking caregiver holidays and uh, or respite. And encourage healthy independence of your loved one as much as possible, depending on what their condition is. And then finally, of course, seeking professional and peer support. Now, I am aware there is one slide that I missed, accidentally skipped over. And uh, I can go back to it, well, I might as well, because it's there. And it's really about grief. So I'm gonna go back, see if I can find it. Because I felt it was important to acknowledge. Oh, it isn't on this one. Okay, that's okay. I will just speak to it then. I did a very brief slide on on grief because I wanted to acknowledge that caregiving to some degree is a journey of grieving. And you know, I don't say that in a negative way, but rather in just the reality is that there is a loss, there's a change in the relationship that you will have and that you do have with the person that you love. And that is one of the most powerful constellation of emotions and experiences to be acknowledged. It isn't just a single feeling. And, you know, that is a journey that you can take on your own with your peer support group, with a professional, but also with the person that you love to have that opening and opportunity to consider how things have shifted. And what I do know about grief in working with people over the years is that at best grief can be transformed. Over time it can be transformed into a deep appreciation for what you do have and what you have had and the connection you have. You don't feel grief if you don't feel love and connection. But it is so important to acknowledge this because again it can be a whole constellation of that caregiving giving experience that is stuffed and then it doesn't make you well. So, you know, important to be able to go down that road and just acknowledge that 
loss and change often entails grief. And, you know, it is part of our journey as humans. Thank you, Donna, for that very thoughtful and, and, and a lot of really valuable points. You know, I realize that we are well past one o'clock and I am so appreciative of of how care partners have to really carve out time for these kinds of, of parts of their days. And so um, I think I, I might propose that we don't take questions right now, but certainly if anybody does have a particular question, if you want to write it uh, to our, our Brain Wellness Program email, and then we can certainly get the answers back to you. So that email address is brain.wellness at ubc.ca and I can put that into the um, into the uh, chat um, uh, so I, I really do want to thank each one of our speakers and I think what this shows is that there is so much to say about your role as a care partner. And perhaps it was unrealistic for us to consider doing this within one hour. Um, it is an enormous role that you play and there's a lot to say in order to support you in it. What I do want to say is that this session is being recorded. And so again, it will be available on the website. Um, so, um, so hopefully uh, people can refer back to it. But I also just quickly want to highlight some of the programs that the Brain Wellness uh, Program is offering specifically for care partners. So we have um, the Art from the Heart program, which is uh, an art therapy type program just for care partners. And we also have a writing program called Express Yourself um, with um, a, a facilitator who is a care partner herself. And, and so that's a writing workshop. And that, again, there's one that is specifically for care partners. So those are a few of the programs that we are currently offering. You will receive a survey um, to, for us to receive feedback for you from you on today's um, offering on our webinar today. And really, we, we, we uh, very much appreciate the time that you put in in responding to this because this is how it, it guides our future programming. And we would really like to expand and go deeper into the offerings for care partners. So watch for that in your emails and um, we appreciate the time that you will take to respond to it and give us your ideas about what you would like to see in terms of future programming for care partners at the Brain Wellness Center. So with that, I guess I would like to again say thank you very much to our speakers and thank you to um, all of you for carving out time today and um, focusing on your wellness. Um, wishes for a wonderful wonderful day going forward. Thank you.